Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our honorable panel has all had to speak. We have had wonderful speeches, and they all get to take questions. And I have questions that are appropriate for all four of them. And I will start with the first question. And the first question is, we hear a great deal about a split between radicals and pragmatists. Is that real? Or is that something of a red herring as a way so that people who want to be in control of the party can create confusion and hang on and keep the party as the old boys club? And you may phrase that question however you see fit. Let's start at the far end with Mary Ruard. Well, I like your rephrasing of the question uh, because I think it's really not between pragmatists and principles or radicals, if you want to call it that, as much as it is between people who understand the non-aggression principle and that there is no conflict between principles and prag pragmatism. In fact, Healing Our World has a thousand references of how liberty works in the real world, and that's one of the reasons I wrote it, because it does work in the real world. So there should be no discrepancy there. I think there is a group of people who have this idea that winning elections is the only way we can win. And this same group, uh, for the most part, is also very interested in control. And if you think about it for a little bit, you know, that's essentially the roots of aggression. You want to control the other person's behavior. And unfortunately, in our society, that is such a prevalent and dominant theme that even among libertarians, uh, those seeds are still there. And, and I think each of us has to be on guard to some extent to see in what respect we as individuals may have taken in some of that culture and not realized it. I mean, that's the challenge of what I call the libertarian evolution. I think it's an ideal that we all have some uh, growth in from time to time. Sometimes it's uh, in, in spurts and starts, and sometimes it's gradual. But you know, until until it is recognized that the non-aggression principle basically says that we, we aren't trying to control our neighbors, and that we don't always have the best idea. The interplay of the marketplace of ideas is the way to go. I think we're going to have people in the party who want that control and are attracted to the political power of it. I mean, that's always been the challenge for us as we enter the political realm. Will we become like the people that we are trying to change? Are we going to become like the other parties? That's always been the temptation for us. And unfortunately, there are some of the parties who have, I believe, succumbed to that temptation. Angela, do you want to add to that? Um, I think we'll add to that. It's not just internalizing the, uh, the, the non aggression principle. I'm going to be able to um, play a little bit of an uh, armchair psychologist here. It's a, it's a lack of understanding of basic, in the most basic vulgar, Randian objectivism. I mean, the, pra the pragmatic whine is always, gee, Angela, you don't want us to win? It's the passive-aggressive whine of someone who <laughs> is not confident. The fact is, the pragmatist reformist wing, their only success has been within taking, turning the Libertarian Party into a little tiny fraternity club. There's not been a single successful, oh, oh let's just ask this, let's put it right out there. Has there ever been anyone in the LP of Indiana who has been elected to office as a libertarian and then got elected to the next level of office. Has that ever occurred? Has it ever occurred in the history of the party? Have we ever gotten someone elected to city council, then elected to mayor, then elected to state senate? No, we have not. It's not a successful strategy. It will never happen. People will call, people who are ignorant of political science will talk about things like the Christian coalition in the 90s taking over school boards. The Christian coalition did not take over America by a long shot. Um, the grassroots movement did not bring about electoral success. The Libertarian Party on this current trajectory has been a terrible, terrible failure with its focus on winning. And when I say a Randy and soap opera, it's literally a contest between people who are serious and ideolo ideological and people who are literally what they used to say secondhand. People who desire success and attention and affection from strangers and a lot of, um, a, to fill up emotional holes. I mean, after all, when you're constantly talking about 
your homeschooled children, your daughter in Harvard, your amazing amounts of money, all the amazing things you are, you are, you are. What the hell does that have to do with the Libertarian Party or Libertarianism or the most basic values of defending human justice and freedom? John. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what to add to this, what I mentioned before and what uh, Angela and Dr. Brewer just said. Uh, this is basically a false dichotomy. The, the question was what we call a law-leading question because you uh, you actually had a hypothet you had a reason uh, you, you you suggested the answer in the question itself. Uh, I think there may be some people who uh, are using uh, this uh, split uh, as a mechanism to gain or keep power and control. But there may be others who actually think that this is uh, a true issue that has to be addressed and that the other group must be expelled at all costs. Uh, regardless, it's incredibly self-defeating. It's very unpragmatic uh, <laughs> to, uh, to keep up this battle uh, you know, within the party. Uh, it leads to nothing except people getting mad and walking out the door. Uh, and the more people that get mad and walk out the door, uh, the less anybody's goals are achieved. The power seekers have fewer people to boss around, uh, and the uh, ideologues uh, have fewer people who to convince to, uh, uh, to accept their principles. So it just doesn't work. Uh, and uh, I, I suspect it will come to an end at some point. I just don't know what will cause that. Mr. Hancock, Ernie. <coughs> I think the issue is becoming irrelevant. As you have, I think it was interesting you said, you know, the pragmatists don't have anybody to boss around, so it's not working for them. The, um, to think that that was really the goal. You know, the goal to get rid of the purists, the purists to get rid of the pragmatists and so on. What has happened is anybody that they would like to attract to gain more credibility and power and effectiveness for either group are just not going. They're leaving. This battle it has been, uh, all it has done is created an alternative method for them to express themselves. It used to be that the Libertarian Party was a liberty nexus. You know, it was a place where people would gather of like mind and then they were, would do something. Well, the, something that they did was always outside the party. So many libertarian organizations and efforts are outside of the party that the movement is much larger outside the party. I remember in 96 when uh, Rick Tompkins was seeking the nomination against Harry Brown, and he was asked one time by media or someone, I, I remember him responding, they said, they go, do you really think you could ever be elected uh, president as a libertarian? And he immediately quit back, he says, if I could be elected as a libertarian, why would I run? And I understood what he meant. If you can be elected as a libertarian in any demographic or geographic area or city or town or jurisdiction, then you've already created a libertarian culture, a society. What the heck would you want to run for? I'd want to live in there. I don't want to be, you know, in government. So this argument between the purist and the pragmatist is over something that will never be resolved, can't be resolved, and people that want to just live free by creating a libertarian and a free culture will see that the Libertarian Party and the organization is not the place to do it. In Arizona, we call it Steiger's Law. There was a congressman, it doesn't matter, he, he made this one point, and I always thought it was really good. Whenever you create an organization or an effort or whatever, sooner or later, the organization becomes more important than the reason it was created. And that happens every single time. And the Libertarian Party has just been neon flash and light example of that. So I'm thinking that this purist pragmatist argument is going to remain in the Libertarian Party and Libertarians are going to bypass it and bypass it by not being involved in the party. Who else has a question? Someone must have a question. Gary? Given the political truism that Okay. Wait for it. <laughs> uh, that whenever you get two or more people in a room, there'll be disagreements. 
And now you move on to your current state where you have an nitrous oxide. And I had this all worked out. This is just so unfair. Don't get um, two more people in the room. Yeah. As you now try to move forward, We have a request for another question over here. Um, uh, some of the problems um, you've been talking about recently, stuff that have been kind of, it's been on my mind with some of the college groups I work at with uh, my university activism, especially Young Americans for Liberty. And it's it started off more ideological at first, and now it's gotten to the point where they're so focused on getting people into campaigns and winning elections that they're always compromising on their principles. The last few conferences I've been to with Yao, they're even trying to get us to compromise, especially on social issues, but even on aspects of intervention overseas with Afghanistan and compromising on certain national defense things, just to get people to win. So I've been distancing myself from them, and luckily our group has the freedom that like Yao chapters can go their own direction. But at the same time, what, what would you do in the situation where you're trying to distance yourself from this and not compromise on your principles, but you also don't want to alienate that other group? Because there's things you can work together, but it's hard to like find that middle ground where you're, you can work together without compromising your principles and then also trying not to alienate them at the same time. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> can I go? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, all to about a minute, please. When? When what? The whole point is, I would imagine, that we want to live in a free society. Right. That's the win. They want credit for the win. Or they want to be in control of whatever's won. Their goal is not liberty. Their goal is control. So you want to have it, stay in them. Go to their meetings. Learn a secret handshake. Whatever. It doesn't matter. But then you take your passion and your activity next to it, outside of it, and you do whatever it is that you want and other people will join you and very quickly you will be the center. You will be the one that they emulate. You will be the one that will attract the attention and get things done. You. That's the way to do it. You don't have to alienate yourself from them. Just outperform them. Yeah, I would add to that, uh, be true to yourself. Uh, it, People in any of these types of organizations that we're talking about uh, respect honesty and they respect consistency. If they don't respect honesty and consistency, then maybe you're not, they're not the kind of people you want to be hanging around with anyway. So uh, it's crucial that at all times uh, you make clear what your principles are, what your ideas are, and, and why you hold them, etc. And if uh, you know, there reaches a tipping point within the group where the group is going in a direction you don't want to go with, with such fervor that you, that you may say to yourself, I don't want to be part of this. But you may not reach that point. Uh, you may instead say, look, I don't like what we did on this, I don't like what we did on that, but I like all these other things that have been done. The key to you for your survival, your psych psychological survival, is to make sure that you understand what you're doing and that you're communicating it to people so you're not putting on a false front. Right. Piece of Angela? Alex, when I was sitting in your chair 20 years ago as president of my college, Libertarians, it was an entirely different scene. There weren't, we didn't have all the Ron Paul youth. Your, your generation's allowed to be much, much pickier than we were. You know, when I was a kid, and I've made this speech before, you know, as a Libertarian, you work with Earth First, you work with the John Birch Society, you work with whomever, issue by issue. Because the goal has never been to create more Libertarians, but to create a free society. So within your, your, your group, you focus on the thing with points of agreement and you carry those out. I mean, you, you are, like I'm an anarcho-pragmatist. I'm going to achieve anarchy in my lifetime by one by one knocking down each pillar of the state. And I do it with the left, particularly with the anti-war movement. I have to, I work with people who have disdain for libertarians, but we get the job done. And that's the, the always keep the end goal in mind. It's really never, it's, you know, you're, you don't have to compromise as long as you keep your focus. Anything you want to add, Mary? Uh, the only thing I would add is that this question is based on an assumption, which we pretty much all accepted in our society, that the way to change society is to win an election. Now, basically my whole talk was about 
but that doesn't have to happen. You know, that's really not necessarily the way. In fact, watching Ron Paul having to compromise, and he's about the least compromising person I, I can think of.